I have, in the past, I played basketball with a guy who had no fingers. Just a thumb. But I've never played basketball with a guy who had no eyes. When it comes to life, how we see life determines how we live life. And if we see it right, we're going to get it right. But if we don't see it right, it won't happen. You see, we have to see ourselves as people who belong to God. And we have to see ourselves as created beings who are servants of the living God. Now I want to bring your attention this morning to a man named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was a man who saw himself as belonging to God, saw himself as a servant of God. He saw himself as having a work to do in this lifetime. <coughs> Nehemiah lived at a time when the nation of Israel was in great difficulty. About a hundred years previously, before Nehemiah, uh, Jerusalem had fallen captive to the Babylonians, and the temple had been destroyed, and the walls had been broken down. And over the past 30 years or so, there was some improvement. There were some good things that were happening, but still such great struggle. What I want to talk to you today about, I believe the message that God has given me to give to you is to be a builder. Okay, God has a work for you to do. He has a calling for me to do. And it's to build. He hasn't called us to destroy, but He's called us to be builders. Amen. Builders of our life in Jesus, builders of the church of Jesus. That's our calling. And what does that look like? What, what did that look like in the life of Nehemiah? I want to read to you chapter 2, verses 11 through 18, and get a little glimpse of what it means to be a builder. Okay, let's begin reading verse 11. Now, as we begin, I want to remind you that Nehemiah was a long way away from Jerusalem, and there's no telephones, and there's... Uh, correspondence takes months. And so Nehemiah hears about the sad state of Jerusalem, how its walls had been broken down, how its city had been in rubbles. And so he hears the news and here's what he does. The Bible says, I went to Jerusalem. And after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. And verse 18, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me, and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Can you say amen at the reading of God's word? Amen. So what do we need in order to accomplish the work 
that God has created us to do and the life that God has given us. What do we need? What are some of the tools of the toolbox, you might say, that God gives to us to be a builder? The very first thing that I gather from reading the scripture is that if we're going to be a builder, we have to have that on the inside. You see, living for God is not just a, a self-help effort. It's not like saying, well, I'm just going to be a better person and I'll do it myself. No, it's having Jesus Christ inside of us, living his life out of us. It's Christ in us and Christ through us. And so it's Jesus himself that gives us this inner motivation, this inner power to do his will. Now, Nehemiah was with the king when he heard the news. It was his brother, Hanani, and some others that had come back from Jerusalem. They went to Nehemiah and they told him, the walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. I mean, this is devastating news for Nehemiah. He doesn't like this news. It does something to him. What do we do when we see tragic things on television? I mean, we are so inundated with bad news that for most of the time, it just passes away, doesn't it? It just comes and it just goes. And so Nehemiah gets this news. And we get bad news too. But it's so easy just to go ahead and let it go by, let it go by. But there's some things that God is going to say, stop, consider, do something. And so Nehemiah, he could have stayed right where he was. He had a great job. You know that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Nehemiah, the Bible says, was a cupbearer to the king. Now here he was, an Israelite in a foreign land, in the land of uh, Persia. And he gets elevated to become cupbearer. Now you say, what's a cupbearer? Well, in those days, if you wanted to kill a high official, oftentimes you would do it through poisoning their food or their drink. It happened a lot. And so Nehemiah had the position where he had to be trusted by the king, where he would go ahead and partake of the food and drink a little bit of the drink before the king would. So if it was poisoned, the king would live and Nehemiah would die. So Nehemiah had this job, and it was a good job. He, had, he was in the palace. Now when he hears this news, his thoughts could have been staying right in the palace. He could have said, oh, that's too bad for them. You know, a passing moment of feeling sorry for them. That's too bad for them, but I'm in the palace. I'm the cupbearer to the king. Does he do that? He allows himself to feel deeply. He opens up his heart. The Bible says that he took these actions. He said, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah is not letting this account just fly over his head, but he's letting it impact him in his heart. He's willing to even cry over what he's heard because he loves because he knows that God has called him to do something about it. The Bible tells us, we as believers in Jesus, that it's the love of Christ that constrains us. You know, in myself and my flesh, I don't really care about people. And neither do you, if you're honest. Who do we care about the most in life? We're, we're on our minds so much. Right? We just think about ourselves hours out of the day. And so we're so self-focused. But Jesus Christ comes in and he teaches us how to love in his love. And how to have compassion and how to do the right thing that's not just focused on me. 
So the Bible says it's the love of Christ that compels us. You see, if we're going to make a difference, we have to have inner motivation. And this motivation comes from Jesus. After all, He loves people enough to die for people. Can't get any greater love than that. So that same love inside of us, Jesus is wanting to go ahead and move and stir. Not just as a passing emotion, but as a life. Be a builder. Now, not only do we need inner motivation to be a builder, we also need to have honest evaluation. Honest evaluation. That's sometimes hard because it's hard for us to admit where we're really at. We're so good at pretending that we're way out here when in reality we're back here. And so God doesn't want us to be honest in evaluation just to humiliate us, but He wants us to be able to have a starting place. God is a God of truth, and we need to be true about ourselves and about where we're at, where we need to go. Because you can't really find a destination until you have a starting place. So honest evaluation. Nehemiah makes the trip. He leaves the cushy palace. He travels for at least three months and arrives in Jerusalem. When he arrives in Jerusalem, he takes three days just to unwind. And then the Bible says, after the third day, by night, Nehemiah says this, I went out examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. So what is Nehemiah doing? As a builder, he's getting an honest appraisal. He's being honest about the evaluation of what needs to be done. And folks, this is not going to be a minor detail. This is a major task. So we have to be careful that in life, we don't pretend that other people's problems or our own situations are just an easy fix. Because sometimes we're in a place where so many things are broken that it's going to take the power of God and it's going to take our willingness day after day to see it happen. Amen. Okay? So he's making this honest evaluation. And so he says to the people, after this evaluation, he tells them what they already know. But he has a, he has a solution as well. So he says to the people, you see the trouble that we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Now people can say, well, we know that. Well, then he goes on. He said, and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, this is pretty depressing. This is pretty bleak for this city. But again, Nehemiah is just putting it out there because he's saying, this is honestly where we are. It's good to be honest, isn't it? I appreciate honesty. I appreciate if someone's going to come to me for, for counsel or for advice, for them to just tell me what the situation is instead of hiding. You understand? We sometimes hide so much. I mean, if we have issues, the best thing to do is get it out to the Lord and talk about it to somebody else that can pray with us. But just get it out. Be honest. I love the Word of God because the Bible doesn't try to deny the facts and the difficulties of life. Now hear me on this, okay? The Bible doesn't try to deny the hardship of life. But what the Bible does is it takes our challenges and lifts them up beside the light of of the power and the majesty of God. Challenging us to live by faith in the things that we cannot see 
to accomplish victories in the things that we can't see. All right? How many of you agree with that? Amen. Okay, so the Bible doesn't say, oh, deny your problems and, and you know, uh, just pretend that you don't have any issues. No, the Bible encourages us to be honest, but only in the light of God's power. That there's a power greater than our problems and our issues. And this is exactly what Nehemiah is doing. He's saying to the people, hey people, we have a problem here. You know, there's stuff going on here that needs help. But he doesn't stop there. Because he's a builder. And so Nehemiah knows that in building, whether it's character, or whether it's the walls of Jerusalem, or whether it's a church, he knows that you need inner motivation. And he knows that you need to have honest evaluation. Here's something else that we need. We need an inspiring vision. Can I just make it real simple? Because I'm a simple person. Vision is simply being able to imagine a preferred future. It's not just being stuck in the present. But it's saying, God, fill me with imagination of what you want this to become. What do you want my life to be? What do you want my church to be? What do you want my community to be? It's not just looking at the rubble of what is, but it's being able to imagine by faith and with God's power what can be. Amen. If you're a builder, you're going to have a vision that you go forward with. All right? You with me? Amen. So Nehemiah, then, as a leader, proclaims a clear vision. Now, it's not difficult to understand the vision. It's not that people that are only the geniuses in the group could figure it out. I mean, it's, the vision is fairly simple. He said, Nehemiah did, he said, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. So he's getting the people to imagine, rather than just looking at all the stones that have been torn down by their enemies, rather than just looking at the charred remains of the gates that were burned with fire, he's getting them to think, what will this city look like having walls, having new gates. Wow, what a difference it would make instead of all the trash, instead of all the piles of rock. So he's getting them to imagine a preferred future that is different from their present reality. So why is he doing this? What's the reason for the vision? The reason for the vision Nehemiah says, it's so that we will not live in disgrace. God doesn't want His children living in shame and condemnation. He doesn't want us living in disgrace because of things that we've done in our past. He has a different vision for us. Now, if you lived in Nehemiah's day, if you lived in a city that had no walls, then you were bait for the enemy any time the enemy wanted to come. Because if you were going to attack a city and it didn't have walls, I mean, that's easy picking. And so Jerusalem was a disgrace because their enemies could trample upon them any time they wanted to. So Nehemiah says, we need a vision here. Okay? Here's what it can be like. And not only that, but Nehemiah saves the best for last. Because I'm sure there's some people that were out there saying, yeah, Nehemiah, you know, we've tried that before. Uh, you know, we have a uh, lot of rubble here, big piles. Who do you think you are? Just think rah, 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 tell us what we need to do. No, he says this. He says, I've come here because God's good hand is upon me and I have favor from the king. In fact, he's given me some papers and I can go and get all kinds of lumber and wood 
blessing to be able to build this wall. Wow, that might have been. Well, would you imagine that being lifting up their encouragement gauge? It certainly was. This was the vision that Nehemiah was sharing with the people. And the Bible says that the people embraced the vision. It was a, a great moment for them because they could see it. Yes, we can do this. These walls can be built. And so the Bible says, in verse 18, they reply, let us start rebuilding. So, they began this good work. It's a good thing, isn't it, to have vision. It's a good thing to have inner motivation. It's a good thing to go after what God has said, I want you to do this with your life. It's a good thing. What are we about as a church? Is our mission as a church just gather together once a week and sit in pews? Is that our mission? Does God have something more for us as a church? Amen. Does He have something? Yes. What is it that He has? We believe in this church that what God has for us can be summarized in this statement right here. We, as people of God here at Highway Tabernacle, want to be about, first and foremost, following Jesus. Folks, if it's not about Jesus, run from it. Amen. Get away from it. If this place... Coming here doesn't make you closer to Jesus than find another church that does. Absolutely. I, I say that from my heart. Because if we're not as a church getting you closer to Jesus, then we are failing you. Amen. Following Jesus and loving people. Now you've noticed, haven't you, that there's some... Uh, people that are in the media especially that want to make out churches to be filled with ugly mean people who hate everybody different from themselves. That's the picture that some people are trying to portray just because we believe in Jesus and we believe the Bible. Because we believe the Bible about sexuality being sacred, we're homophobies and we're uh, bigots and we're hate haters. Absolutely not. In fact, we love people enough to tell them about Jesus and to also say, you know, the Bible's going to be true a lot longer than the opinions of man. Amen. Hello? Amen. So what are we about? We're about following Jesus and loving people. And as we do this, what we're doing is we're sharing hope. Amen. You can have everything to live with and nothing to live for. People in Philadelphia crowd their schedules with every single thing, that activity that comes along. I mean, we live in a city where every single night there can be something you can do. And so we think that out of the abundance of our calendar, we will find satisfaction and hope. And yet, deep down, if you drill down into people's hearts, you will see people are empty and devoid of hope. They don't even know why they're living. How can you have hope in life if you don't even know where you're going after you die? I'll give you a news flash. You're going to be dead a lot longer than you're going to be alive. And if you don't know what's going to happen to you after you die, then you're living a life that doesn't have any hope. So we want to be a people who share hope. Now, let me tell you something about vision. It's easy to talk about, but it's not so easy to persevere. Here's the last thing I want to share with you about being a builder. If you're a builder, 
You're going to need to have a commitment to perseverance. Anybody can have a dream, right? I hear it all the time. You know, I have this great dream or I have this great vision. You know, there's one thing about dreams and visions. They always seem to boil down to work. Right? But it's a good work. You see, our daily lives are to be involved in fulfilling the vision of God by what we do every day. It's not just by some dream or some vision. We can take words and plaster them on the wall. It's, It's more than that. There's perseverance that's needed. Perseverance goes beyond words. Nehemiah had words, right? His words were, let's rebuild the walls. And the people had words. What were the words of the people? Yes, let us rebuild the walls. So, you know, this was like the, uh, the pep rally. You know? Coach is up there saying, we can do this. And the people are there, you know, with their pom-poms and cheers. Yes, we can do this. Emotion is easy. Devotion is harder. I've been married 38 years, and I can tell you something. What's kept us is not emotional love. It's devotional love. I was surfing the internet on Facebook. And there's a certain lady named Maria in this, Maria Ruiz, I'm not sure. She, Maria, I saw on your Facebook this quote, and I hope you don't mind, I lifted it off. Okay? This is great. I looked at this and I said, yes. All right, can I read it to you? Compliments of Maria's Facebook. Amen. Commitment. Commitment means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. Whoa, isn't that good? It's easy to promise people the world. Oh yeah, I'll be there, I'll do that. I'm sure you can count on me. Those words can fly. They're just easy to say. But when the emotion passes and all you're left with is raw commitment, if you're going to be a builder, then you stick with it. Hello? You stick with it. So it's going to take commitment. Perseverance goes beyond the chaos. You know, if you're following God and God's will, sometimes you're going to just feel like you're in the midst of chaos. You're trying to help people. You're trying to bless people. Sometimes it just seems like it just swirls. You know, you're like Nehemiah and the people. You just see one pile of rubble after another, and you're wondering, wow, how do we even start? Can I tell you how to start? How to go for the vision? When you see a pile of rocks, you fulfill God's vision by moving them one rock at a time. That's all you have to do, is just one rock at a time. If you look at the whole pile, you can be easily overwhelmed. Now, I'm no great, you know, athlete. I'm no great, you know, weightlifter, but I try, all right? And... When I'm at the gym, I have a certain exercise that I do that looks like this. I sit in a bench, there's a bar across the and there's weight behind it, and I push out. Those are called chest presses or whatever they are. And I start out doing 13 of those, and they're about 120 pounds. And sometimes I sit there and I say to myself, I can't do 13 of these. 
<laughs> That's like 1,500 pounds. But I can do one. So I push out one. Goes back. You know what? I can do that. I can do two. Do it again. I can do one more. And before I know it, I've done all 13. I can't do them all at the same time. But I can do one at a time. Okay? So God's not asking you to, you know, uh, perform these uh, great, amazing feats that, you know, require you to climb Mount Everest tomorrow. He's just asking you to follow Him, to love people, right? And to share hope. Now, not only does perseverance require us to go beyond just words and beyond the chaos, but perseverance requires us to go beyond discouragement. Now, I know none of you have ever struggled with discouragement, but sometimes, you know, I struggle with this, all right? What happens is this. We get our eyes on just the problems. It's easy to think to yourself as you walk by the pile of stones every day and you see the trash in the city. It's easy to say, things will never change. It's easy to say that. Because the pile's been there a long time. And that wall's been broken down a long time. And those gates have been burned for a long time. So it's easy to become discouraged when you think that things can never change. Maybe you're in a difficult job and your boss is Satan's brother. I mean, or maybe you're in a difficult home situation and finances just seem to be so tough all the time and you think things will never change. That's exactly what the enemy wants us to think. Get depressed, get discouraged. Give up. Our problem is this oftentimes. We put labels on things as if that was the gospel truth. So we walk by a big pile of stones and we've already labeled that pile of stones. Oh, that's, that's hopeless. That's that pile. And then we go to the next pile of stones and say, oh yeah, that, that pile is called depressing. Got it. I walk by that every day. And then we have another pile of stones that has a little bit longer title. This can never change pile of stones. You see, we label them, and then in our mind we think, well, I could never do anything about that. This has always been that way. It will always stay that way. And folks, let me get real personal with you before I close. Okay, I hope you don't get mad. But sometimes we label ourselves Amen. by what other people have labeled us. That's right. I can never serve God because I'm an addict. So we have this invisible sign, addict. I can't resist temptation. I can't serve God because after all, I'll always be an addict. And we get the same thing happen to us by way of terms that even good people can give to us that want to try to help us. They might call us disabled. Now, I'm not against disabled people, believe me. I know sometimes things happen and we find ourselves, you know, unable to do certain things. But there are a lot of people who have adopted the label disabled so that when any challenge comes along from God, they say, oh, I can't do that. I, I can't even think about that because I am disabled. Hello? Amen. You see, we are more than our label. And if we're going to make progress and deal with some of the stones and the rubble, we have to take the labels off. That's right. Sometimes people will say, well, I'm just uh, bipolar. I can, you know, I can never do anything for God. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. We might have struggles in life, but that doesn't mean that we're always going to be there. That's right. God has something for you. He has something for this church. Yes, he does. If we're willing to be builders. 
And so I'd like to have you say the same thing that the people said. Here's what the people said. Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And do you know, amazingly, they were able to build that wall in 52 days. What's that? Maybe uh, less than uh, two months, right? They were able, with the help of God, to build the wall. And it was the enemy who was depressed and discouraged. God has a work for you to do. Now the work will always be there. But you can accomplish the work that he's called you to do. When Jesus was on the cross, there was still a lot of ministry to be done. Mm -hmm. But he was able to say, it is finished. So you can come to the end and say, it is finished. You can complete the work that God has called you to do if you have a heart of a builder. Okay? Amen. That's all I have to say to you today. You guys want to build with me? Amen. You want to? Let's build. I mean, we need to do this. Amen. This is God's call.